Um, lots to talk about. Uh, I, I keep making the point that the news cycle is so insane these days that um, it's very hard for me to ever predict my show. I, I do a two o'clock show every day, and you know we've torn up our rundown because there's a tweet or there's something inevitably that has happened, um, and, and that's not even including the market volatility, which. Uh, has just been all over the place. It's very hard to predict where the market's going to be at 2 o'clock based on whatever futures you're looking at in the morning. But uh, it's certainly been exciting, <laughs> you could say. Um, I, I, I want to remind everyone that we're going to open this up for questions and conversation at the end, sort of within the last 15 minutes. And so just uh, be thinking about those questions as you hear the Secretary speak. Um, but I, I'd like to hear from you. First off, uh, where you see this economy right now, and you know, politics aside, because we can get into that, and there's obviously a lot of feelings um, and divisiveness right now um, in Washington and the country, but looking purely at where we are in the present state, what is your thought? Over what economy. period of time, Trish? You mean right next, now, next right now. I mean, so? where are we, yeah, within okay. the next year or so, and then we yeah. can go further out, because yeah. I know you have some long-term concerns No, as no, well. no, I'll give you my, I have short-term concerns, too. <laughs> 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 I have concerns about everything. But, no, I'll give you my view, whatever it's worth. I think you've got global growth. Europe is growing, China's growing, we're growing. It, it's, for the moment, at least, there's a sort of, some, uh, there's a kind of a, a global growth pattern, and I think the probabilities are that that continues through this year, and and into next, uh, uh, if you look at the, I mean, all you do the same thing I do, you look at what different people project, and people seem to be projecting growth this year for 2.7, something like that. You know, who the hell knows what 2.5 or 3, but you know, 2.7, mm -hmm. and probably less for next year. But what I guess what I'm struck by is something a little bit different, Trish. I, I think there are enormous, I'm an investor, by the way, as I suspect many of you are, and I'm principally invested in private equity, because I think it's wiser to be long-term than short-term. But, um, and for other reasons, but I think there are very substantial short-term risks, the risks over the next year or two, so that the, 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 the comments I just made are subject to the caveat that they think there are a lot of ways this could go wrong. And I, at least for one, think that even if the markets are appropriately valued by conventional metrics, I agree with something Janet Yellen said just before Janet stepped down as chair of the Fed, that she, she said this as chair, that she thought the markets, the equity markets were under discounting the substantial risks that we face. And just to tick them off very briefly, uh, trade. It is certainly possible, given the views of the administration, that we could have counterproductive trade decisions. I think we're having counterproductive trade decisions right now, actually. And they could increase prices here for both consumers and producers. If carried far enough, they could lead to trade wars, which I think would be a very serious issue for our economy, as well as the global economy. Uh, geopolitics, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, this Iran thing unsettles that little piece of the world, and we, nobody knows what Iran's going to do, nobody knows what we'll do in response, et cetera. I mean, these are all questions of probabilities, obviously. North Korea, I'm no expert in geopolitics, but I have an office of the Council on Foreign Relations, which I chaired until very recently, and I still have an office there. I hang around a lot with people who know a lot about this, even though I don't. And I don't know anybody who has knowledge about North Korea that thinks a real, a, a real denuclearization will come out of this. That is to say, it may well come something that the administration can claim as a triumph or a victory, but not a real neutralization. So who the heck knows, Trish, where all that's going to go? Mm -hmm. uh, the Middle East and uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia has been very aggressive. We all know that. Does that create risks? So I think we live in a world with, with a lot of, uh, look, the market itself. The market's been up for nine straight years, except for one year it was almost flat, mm -hmm. just down slightly. Markets don't go, markets don't go up forever. And any of the risks I've just uh, articulated, plus plenty that I haven't, if materialized, could, could upset markets, and then markets could themselves become a risk. So I think we live in a world that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of risk, and I think the markets are basically under discounting those risks, at least in the shorter term. The long term is a different, different mm -hmm. question. Are they not fully recognizing them in part because of tax reform and the expectation that companies are going to earn more money, make more money, keep more money, um, also the onshoring of trillions of dollars overseas, the expectation once again that this should benefit corporate America. Is that why the markets 
excited? I, look, I'm, who the, you know, who knows ever what, look, I've done this for a long time, and at one time I ran, I was responsible for all trade, well, for, actually for a long time, responsible for all trading operations at Goldman Sachs. One of the lessons I learned is who the heck knows why markets do what they do. But I've noticed amongst people who have a lot of money, and I know a reasonable number of people do have a lot of money. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> Most of them are pretty concerned, Trish. They really are. The kinds of things that I've just articulated, plus, and this is not a political comment, it's just a, 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 a I'll call it a substantive comment. Ultimately, decisions all come, significant decisions all come to the president. Mm -hmm. So what you want is you want a president with sound judgment, makes informed judgments, judgments that are grounded in process, is balanced, is unemotional, is strategic. And you can decide whether you think that is currently the case or not. Some people seem to think it's not. If it's not, then that exacerbates or heightens all the risks I've just described, plus it creates the risk of unforeseen developments. So a lot of people I know, I think most people I know actually that have a lot of money, are, are concerned about everything I've just talked about. But on the other hand, you've got momentum and they don't want to sell out yet, so they say, well, it isn't quite time to get out yet. My impression about markets is when everybody decides it's not time to get out yet and they're thinking, well, but we'll all get, but we'll get out in time, you can't all get out in time. So I'm not suggesting anybody buy, sell, or do anything else. I'm just saying I'd have a, I would have a long-term perspective, which I have a positive long-term perspective in the United States, subject to a very a giant caveat, which we can discuss. Mm -hmm. But I think I'd also be very cautious. I, I would adjust myself with some, and I have for me, adjust myself with some caution for the shorter term. I don't I mean, think within that, the next year, you think things could go that poorly? No. Within the next 12 months? I mean, what are the problem? Everything's a question of odds, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are the odds that, given the administration's animus toward China, and the trade demands that they're making of China, that that erupts into some kind of a trade war. I don't know, the odds 5%, are they 10% or 20%? Mm -hmm. I don't know, the foggiest notion. I, I, think, I think it is usually counterproductive. I personally think our posture is usually counterproductive. I think there are tremendous issues that China's trade policies have raised, and I think they should be addressed, but you don't address them in, in, in the very public way that they have. I, I actually know a little bit about China. You don't do it in the very public ways they have because all you do is force them into a corner where they run the risk of losing face. And I think it makes it much, much more difficult to accomplish anything. You, you, you so could these materialize? Yeah, they could. I don't know what the odds are. I, I think what you just said, though, is very interesting in that, that they are real issues. I mean, you look at the, the intellectual property oh, sure theft, are. for example. Uh, you, you, you look at all that China has done to, to advance its own economy. And there may have been a point in time where it didn't really matter because China wasn't that big a deal. Well, hello, China is a really, really big deal. I agree. Uh, both economically and, and possibly in terms of its military as well. So as we think about how our country and economy is positioned in the next 30 years, and by the way, I mean, we're, we're looking at two years, four years, you know, or six years, right? And maybe eight if you think you're going to get two terms. But they're looking at the next hundred years, and they're playing for a much longer term than so many of our um, policy types are. So uh, what is your concern in terms of if you fast forward a couple of decades if we don't do something about China? Yeah, but there's something that you would do and there's something that I would do maybe a little bit different. There's something I would do. Uh, Hank Paulson and I wrote a piece for The Atlantic three years ago, four years ago, I don't remember anymore exactly, and I made, the same, and I made a speech along the same lines at the China Development Forum, I think three years ago. What I would do about China is exactly the opposite of what we're doing. I would try to figure out a constructive way to engage with China that's in our mutual self-interest for the long term. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I would say to the Chinese, there are very, and I think you're absolutely right, Trish, there are aspects of, techn of, of techn predatory technological prod mm -hmm process that we cannot live with. Right. And I would do it quietly, mm -hmm. and I would do it in a way, and I, I have some reason to think that there would be some reasonable receptivity if we were doing it in some sensible way, and if they had people they thought they could engage with that had the same sort of broad sense that I just or tried to describe at least of, of the mutual self-interest our two countries could have, but we're not in that position with respect to them at all. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, something That's should be done. That's my view. I'm not saying something right. should be done about China. It's just a question of how do you go about no, it. No, right no. When you say something should be done about China, no, something should be done with China, mm -hmm. not about China. Um, We're not going to do things about China. I don't what, believe. What about another anything. version then of? Is, could you have a TPP 2.0, for example, another version of that? Because I think the goal initially was to make sure that you exerted enough pressure on China in a positive way that they would want to be part of the world trade community. Um, do you get back to something like that? Look, the irony of TPP was that the politics became impossible. And so Hillary turned against it after describing it as the gold standard of trade treaties. Right. Uh, Trump came out against it, and it, 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 it was not politically feasible, but the, the, the sad thing there was exactly what you said. It was a set of trade principles which 
although China wasn't part of it, presumably they would have become part at some point, would have created a, a, a global trade re regime, if you will, that was sensible and that was consistent with the ways we think about trade. And, and, and yet on both parties, it, it, was, uh, it became impossible. But maybe it can still be done. Well, the only way, boy, it would be hard. I, you'd have to start with the president who was really committed to it. Mm -hmm. And even so, in both the Democratic and the political party, the commitment to trade has, has diminished enormously. Mm -hmm. When I was there, we did trade because the Republicans supported it. The Democrats were generally speaking against it. Right. That support in the Republican Party has been lost. So now you don't have either party supporting it. It would be very tough, but it has to start with, and I don't think, I, I honestly don't know what, I don't know what, the, honestly, I don't know what the odds would be, Trish, but if you're going to take a shot at least at doing it, mm -hmm. and I think it would be very difficult politically, you'd have to start with a president that had a very serious and, and well thought through strategic commitment to it, and then a, a politics to try to realize that, that, mm -hmm. that vision. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to the domestic economy sure. for a moment. Um, the consumer seems to be feeling better right now. We've seen a lot of statistics on the confidence and sentiment front that indicate people feel more positive about things. A lot of CEOs are feeling more positive. Um, in sort of the here and now environment, what does that do for the economy overall? And I will tell you, one of the, the disappointing things I found uh, in the last administration was that every time we get a little bit of good economic news, uh, the president, President Obama, would say, okay, you know, this is good, it's a good jobs report, but we get a whole long ways to go. We now have the opposite of that, because I think this president, <laughs> you know, he is totally glass half full um, when it serves his purpose. That said, there is something contagious about it for a lot of middle Americans that are there. When they hear optimism and they see the projection of optimism, uh, there's a little excitement that goes with that. And you think about the animal spirits of our economy and our consumer and how critical that is. Um, given that confidence levels are high, does that lend itself to a better economy right now? Well, I'm a great believer that animal spirits are pretty key to what, that's what Keynes referred to animal spirits. And I think they are very central to what goes on economically. And when President Clinton was there in that very first February that we were there, Trish, he gave a, a radio address or remarks on radio in which he had a kind of a, I would say, a, 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 mixed, a, a mixed tone about, about certain aspects of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. President, and he believed in the private sector. He was just, this, let's not worry about why he was doing it. And I said, Mr. President, animal spirits are really centrally important to economic, what happens economically, and that tone doesn't work. For eight years, he struck a positive tone. Yeah. Obama had a more mixed record in that respect. No, I don't think that what Trump is doing is constructive because I think, I think he's just, well, let's not get into Trump. Let's not worry about him. <laughs> I, I, do not think, <laughs> I, I do not think that that is the way to generate either economic confidence or, or, a, or a favorable economy. I think we have a favorable economy because, at least for now, growth in Europe is far surpassing what people thought it would be. Mm -hmm. China's doing well. We're doing well. They all reinforce each other, and that's, a, that's a, a positive. There's a aspect to it. Um, one of the, the dangers for the economy uh, is one that I, I didn't hear you mention yet, and I'd like to get your thoughts on, and that's a higher interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about um, the... The, the post-2008 environment where you had a very aggressive Federal Reserve, and now the Fed is moving in another direction entirely. And so as interest rates tick higher, and I haven't seen the 10-year today, but we were at, what, 3.08% yesterday, um, how much of that hurts growth? Well, can we handle it? sure. But, but I mean, the reality of life, Trish, is that you've got 3.9% unemployment or some such number like mm -hmm. that. Although it was an interesting, there was another piece of data that came out today. 40% of the American people have a difficult time, a difficult time getting enough to eat and getting decent shelter and, and a decent way of life. And we still have a terrible problem in the bottom half of our population, uh, roughly speaking, the bottom half. I think it was numbers 40% or something in, in that, that particular survey. But in terms of interest rates, look, as, as you have growth, interest rates are going to go up. And presumably, we have... Full, full employment demand right now. Yeah. And I think one of the risks is sort of the opposite of what you said. If, if the Fed adjusts in an appropriate fashion so that it meets the dual mandate of Humphrey Hawkins, full employment and low inflation, mm -hmm. then they'll be raising rates at whatever level of calibration they think they need. One of the things that I'm troubled about is that if they start to raise rates, remember Trump has talked about 3% growth, 4% growth, none of those, are, there's no mainstream economist conservative or, or, or liberal that I know of who thinks those are realistic projections for anything more possibly in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. 
So if they start raising rates and if he gets upset and he starts tweeting one thing or another, will they fail, will they accommodate that or will they continue to stick to, their, to the Humphrey Horton's mandate? If they fail to stick to it, if they, if they accede to the pressures, then you could start to build up inflationary expectations. And once those are, under, are out, as we know from the, the carter Volcker period, that can be very difficult to deal with. I personally have a lot of confidence in Jay Powell. I know Jay reasonably well. I haven't seen him lately, but I, I did know him reasonably well at one time. I, I think he'll stick to what he thinks is right. Mm -hmm. And the bond market, look, the 10-year-old will do position. whatever it wants to do. And if, exactly. they, if people start to worry about inflation or they start to worry about our horrendous fiscal trajectory, uh, then you, 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 know, you could see a 10-year that got unmoored from Fed funds mm -hmm. and the rates go up. If rates go up, that's a negative for growth. But, but, if, but if they go up because they're driven by growth, it, it's sort then of a it's natural. Then it's kind of okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, no exactly. I hear you. In yeah. fact, I, I, I look at the, the yield you on the 10-year now and I... I think sometimes the market overreacts and gets a little too scared um, because you should be, you know, upwards of yeah, 3%. I think you got exactly right. Um, let me ask you about wages, though, because this I find very perplexing. Uh -huh. Given that we have such low unemployment levels, um, given that we are seeing better growth, why aren't wages moving? Trish, I spend probably half of my time these days, maybe more than that, with people involved in policy activity even though I have a paying job, so I don't tell the people who pay me that. But that <laughs> nevertheless is true. And it is, it's one of the great conundrums of the present environment. And I think probably a little bit of the answer is that uh, and, uh, wages, after all, are a function of, of what employers and employees do, and there's virtually no labor movement anymore. So in terms of the bargaining power of labor, it's been greatly diminished. That's part of it. But it's not the whole explanation. Oh, I, I think part of it is whenever wages, and this I think is, mm -hmm. is, is also the case, part of it is that you have weak labor unions. That's part of it. Part of it is that as wages rise in any sector, technology tends to displace workers. Yeah. So that's part of it. But part of it is really, is, is really a bit of conundrum. Tradition. I know a lot of people, I mean, serious labor economists who spend tons of time on this, and they're, they're a bit uh, wondering about the same question. Well, and I know you don't want to get into to Trump too much, but... I see this as one of the reasons why he was successful, because I talk a lot about the hourglass economy, and we got a lot of people on top, and we got a lot of people on the bottom. The middle's very squeezed, um, and I think that you mentioned labor unions, and this is why, you know, politically speaking, it's kind of a weird environment because I was telling you, I grew up Irish Catholic. And you were Democrat like you were Irish and Catholic. I mean, it was like a religion. Um, and part of that, you know, unions, you, you prayed for a union job. If you could be part of the union, then, you know, you, you had really made it. Um, because you wanted that protection. And, you know, from a family of laborers, that was, that was the ideal. And you look at the, the weakness in labor right now, and this is why I think you know, what we have seen happen in Pennsylvania was a great example of this, both in terms of Hillary Clinton's loss um, and, and Donald Trump's success, and what you saw now with Connor Lamb there getting the Senate seat um, because he embraced a lot of the economic not, principles. Not the Senate seat, you got uh, forgive me. House seat. Yes, because he, he embraced so many of the uh, economic principles that um, traditionally were Democrat, but now have become sort of Trumpism. We have seen an environment where those with capital have been rewarded and sort of at the expense, if you would, of labor. How does that start to change? Because we still need labor. I, got, I think you got it exactly right, Trish. Here's my view of whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. and I think it's exactly what you said. I think there's a tectonic change going on in our economy. And you all know this. I mean, you know it extremely well. Technology, the technological development, the implementation of technology are, and globalization are a tremendous plus, or at least potentially plus, for productivity. But on the other hand, they're creating tremendous pressure on wages. And they're creating a lot of job dislocation. That pressure, in turn, along with cult, a sense of cultural dislocation, mm -hmm. which is partly racial, partly geographic, partly ethnic, has, as I think, contributed to the populism that fueled both Trump and Bernie Sanders. Yeah. They both basically but, uh, played yeah. off the same, and, and it's grounded in a real problem. I don't think the answers that either Bernie Sanders or Trump are providing are responsive to the problem. The trouble is, I'll never forget something Fritz Mondale told me in 84. He said, and this, I think, is equally true today. He said, we are facing very complex problems, and I, now, Monday wasn't going to win that election against Trump no matter what. I mean, not Trump, against Reagan. <laughs> Reagan was, I think, a seriously good president, so I don't mean to. But 
uh, uh, denigrate him. Um, but he said, you know, it's very hard to explain to the American people the complex responses we need to complex problems, and the bumper sticker people win, win all the time. And I think, unfortunately, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post before the election, and it was my views, and you could disagree with my views, I'm not saying they're right, but they were the, 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 the the policies I think we need to address, the problem you very correctly articulated. Mm. The politics of it are very difficult, and nobody in, in political life, at least at the present time, is, is, is articulating a message that sort of, if you will, embraces those kinds of policies, but in a, in a politically resonant fashion. So instead, they run on bumper stickers. Yeah, I, in sound bites, and you know, you can probably blame the media to a certain extent as well. We'll we'll take some responsibility there too, because uh, life has been sort of um, distilled down into those those sound bites. Let me let us let us hope for one. You know, here, here's something I hope for, Trish, but God knows I don't know if it'll happen. 18 will be the midterms will be whatever they're going to be, and we'll see. Mm -hmm. What I'm hoping is that people emerge in 2020, and this may be a vain hope on both the Republican side and the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. the Republican would be a primary, and the Democrats will be whoever's going to get it. Who, are instead of, who find a way to do what Clinton did in 92, which is to make serious policy politically resonant. But it's tough. And this is a different He did do that, that very successfully. He was an extraordinary mm -hmm. politician. Well, that's the a point. A gifted, gifted, gifted politician um, who also had you know, the intellect to go with it and surrounded himself clearly, obviously, with, with other great intellects like yourself. But um, mm. it's, it's, he, he it's would, a tricky He would not thing. be trying to extend that credit quite so much. But, <laughs> but uh, and, you know, and look, you guys were able to accomplish a lot. Um, and we, we give you tremendous credit for being able to reach across the aisle and for being able to budget, I mean, to, to balance the budget. Um, I don't know if that's possible in this environment, and, and you can blame Trump for it, but I also blame the other side as well, because I think when you have Maxine Waters leading an effort to just impeach no matter what, no matter what the evidence is, you have such animosity on both sides that I don't know how you get to uh, Chris, face. I, I don't know how we get, I, I think everything you said is correct, and I don't, well, most of what you said is correct. <laughs> And I don't know how we get back to that, but I don't think that this country su can succeed in the long run unless in one way or another it can reestablish effective government. And effective government has to be an environment in which there is a willingness to engage in principle compromise the way Trent Lott did with mm -hmm. President Clinton in 1997. I believe somehow or other we'll get back there, though it is very, but based on current empirical evidence, you can't help but be deeply, deeply concerned. But I could make a case, and I actually believe this. I believe that the probabilities, everything question of odds, no guarantees. I believe the odds are we will get back there. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. Right now, you sure as hell can't see it. Mm -hmm. And it does take a sort of a bit of an act of faith to, to have that view that I have. So let me go back to policy for a second, because tax policy, I mean, I Tell me your, your fundamental thoughts on lowering corporate taxes, because it seems to me that you know if we want to be competitive in the world, I don't understand why we're okay with having the highest corporate tax. Why wouldn't you want to lower that? Well, I would have liked to lower it, not to the level it did, but lower it, but I sure as heck wouldn't have done it with deficit funding. Okay. And I think that if you weigh the effects of the, this was totally deficit funded. Mm -hmm. there, there was no pay for it. In fact, the, the, the legislation, as you know, provided for $1.5 trillion of deficit funding. If you add on to that the extension of the sunsets, which Mnuchin says they're going to do, and I think probably no matter who's in power, they'll probably do it, and then you add on to a debt service, you get up to somewhere $2.2 trillion, $2.3 trillion, $2.4 trillion, something like that, over 10 years. And I think, personally, the economic cost of that is going to vastly exceed the benefit of lowering the rates. So, yes, do I think rates should have been lowered somewhat, though not to what they were? Mm -hmm. But I don't think I would, I would absolutely not have done it without paying for it. And I will point out, I said this before, so I'm just repeating myself. Goldman Sachs put out a report in which they said they thought that the average growth effect of the lowering the taxes, cut corporate taxes, no, the whole tax bill actually, would be 12 basis points over five years on average. So the which thinking is, the is, but the thinking is, is that by lowering corporate taxes, you're stimulating the economy and therefore growing GDP, so you're going to increase your tax base as a result of that. What do you say about that theory? What I say about that is it's just what I said. Uh, yes, if, well, first of all, even those, who, let me say, even those who advocated the tax cut, for the most part, acknowledge it isn't going to give you nearly enough growth to pay for it. Marty Feldstein, mm -hmm. who is an advocate of the tax cut, said he thinks it's going to cost at least a trillion dollars after 
the dynamic scoring effect. All right. uh -huh. uh, but if you take Goldman Sachs's estimates or the Penn Wharton estimates of growth, you're getting very, very little growth. Uh, uh, I, I actually did a little, had somebody do a little thing for me. And if you take all of the sort of mainstream views, you probably wind up saying that the thing is going to cost us about $2 trillion and the mainstream views on dynamic scoring, mm -hmm. what you're talking about, is maybe you pick up 400 million in revenue from additional mm -hmm. growth, so you're out of billions, out of trillion six, something like that. So what's the alternative? If you say, okay, we're not gonna give a tax cut. Well, you gave a tax cut. Well, what if we didn't? What if we hadn't? Oh, what I would have done? Is that what you're saying? Sure, asking? yeah, I mean, what, 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 I mean, how do you get this economy going? I don't think the tax cuts have as much to do with what's going on right now. Uh, I think it's global, I think it's, uh, Goldman Sachs is, I mean, Goldman Sachs is, is not a, you know, they're nonpartisan, whatever they are, organization. They estimated that the, the fiscal effect, the fiscal demand, the, I'm sorry, the fiscal demand effect on real growth this year will be 0.3%, mm -hmm. and then it averages, and then it goes down, so that, as I said a moment ago, over five years, it averages out 12, and a half, 12 basis points. Mm -hmm. So there isn't very much from the tax cut. Um, Having said that, I think we should have brought our corporate rate down. I think probably, I, I, I mean, just as my view, and you could take 10 different people to get 10 different views, I would have brought it down to about 28%, but I would have paid for it. How would you have paid for it? Oh, I think there's a lot you can do, and I think none of it was doable politically. Like what? Like the things you could do to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Go through it. Go, tell me. Tell me how you do it. I would have done it by doing the appropriate measures to pay for it. I'll tell you what I wouldn't have done. Uh, I wouldn't have done a fair bit of what we had, did do. Oh, look, there, there, you, you could, for example, you could take the 35%, well, then it was 35%. I wouldn't have lowered the top individual rates at all. Mm -hmm. I think even a lot of the advocates of the corporate tax rates say that didn't do it. So I would have taken the deduction. Obama actually proposed this, but didn't get anywhere. And I, instead of allowing a deduction, I would have had a 28% credit. I don't know how much that raises, mm -hmm. but that raises part of the money. Mm -hmm. I think we should have what Hank Paulson, Jim Baker, and George Shultz advocated, but the politics of this, and this, by the way, would go a long way to do it, and that's a carbon tax. Now, the politics, we all know the politics of a carbon tax at the present time are impossible. Mm -hmm. But Trish, if we start to think a little bit longer term, all, I'm going to tell you, you all know this. The, the debt to GDP ratio right now is 77%. It is generally estimated that 10 years from now it will be about 100%. Mm -hmm. It is generally estimated that 30 years out from now, which is the CBO time frame for whatever reason, I don't know why, it gets to about 165%. We're not going to be able to live with that. No. You're going to have to have additional revenues. You're going to have to figure out a way to deal with entitlements. I think there are ways to deal with entitlements where they don't cut the benefits but reduce the rate of growth of entitlements. Uh -huh. But one thing you could do, a carbon tax is a big deal. Now, the problem with the carbon tax is it's regressive. And so a lot of Democrats, in fact, probably almost all Democrats, are going to say, if we have a regressive tax, we should return that money to the people in the form of public investment. I kind of think that's both right and wrong. It's right in the sense it's regressive, and that's not good when people, as you said, at the bottom mm -hmm. half are suffering to begin with. And on the other hand, if you don't keep some of it for deficit reduction, then you're not getting any fiscal benefit. These well, are, these are, none of this is simple. There's no easy way forward. Yeah, but, but I think the wrong way forward is just to continue to be on the path that we're in where we have... A, very, a terrible fiscal trajectory. We're vastly underinvested in human capital. We're vastly underinvested in infrastructure. Uh, I had the, the head of the AI lab at MIT down at the council the other day. Well, no, it was a few weeks ago now. And she said that China has a massive program devoted to investment in AI, artificial intelligence, and we don't. Yeah. We can't continue on that path. Yeah, no, and, and increasingly I keep hearing from investors that it, private equity investors, you've probably run into this yourself, just that China is pouring so much money into that sector, it's hard for them even to compete. Um, and China doesn't necessarily care, right? They just, they just pour all the money in, and, and they're hoping that a few of them hit. Um, we're obviously more judicious about it, but you know, the government itself, when it's pouring that kind of money in, um, you know, it stands to reason that they're, they're going to score a few successes along the mm -hmm. way, and, and that'll, that success will go to them. But you touched on something that I think is the, is the most difficult thing of all, and that's entitlement reform. And I don't know how we, you know, we, your projections are, I think I'm a little more optimistic than you, <laughs> but, I'm not, my, but my, you're my, on to something. No, 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 the projections I would use it up mine. 
I'm, I'm a retread lawyer. These, these are the, <laughs> the CBO's projections, the t tax policy center's projections, yeah. Penn Wharton. I mean, these are yeah. the I, Goldman you know, Sachs. These are the people who do this stuff for a living. I would say my hope here is that the consumer is feeling so much better about things, um, that that feeds upon itself, that the corporate sector's doing better, et cetera, and maybe we'll get a bigger GDP bump than anybody thinks and hopefully collect more tax revenue and start to... Um, really succeed. But but nonetheless, you're, you're talking about some serious, serious structural difficulties. And if there's no political will to fix it, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the, you know, maybe, hey, maybe we become France, China becomes the next United States of America. And, you know, we're kind of, for lack of a better word, dare I say, sort of screwed in this process, because 30 years out, um, we're not going to be able to support this. The interest rates on the debt are going to be so significant. It's got to be a lot short, sooner than 30 years, in my opinion. But that doesn't have to be, Trish. We have such tremendous advantages over China. We really do. We have a rule of law. They don't have it. We have a deeply embedded market-based economy. They're moving back toward the state-owned enterprises. We have a dynamic culture. We have a dynamic private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, we have vast natural resources. We have the, the greatest universities in the world. Mm -hmm. we, we, have, we had, at least until recently, sensible uh, immigration policies, though, so we're getting a lot of the best and the brightest, now we're screwing that up a little bit, but the, or a lot actually, but the best and the brightest from around the world. It's just that we've got to deal with our own. If we deal with our issues, I'd much rather bet on us than China. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I, the sad thing is that, that our political system is broken. But that, um, you know, I think if, if you believe fundamentally in what this country is, though, even if it's broken, it will fix itself because the pendulum Ooh. always swings. And perhaps, always. what? Always has swung. Always has swung, but in, it, it, again, but back to before. why Donald Trump won this election, it was in part because of this, this pendulum that, you know, look, I think Clinton, his personal life aside, um, did some pretty good things. And he, you know, obviously uh, oversaw a terrific economy at a great time when technology was booming uh, and was able to succeed in bipartisanship and balancing the budget, and these are, these are great, great things. Can we get back to that? I, I unfortunately think Obama um, failed on, on a lot of the, the optimism and the sort of goodwill that he had coming in, uh, and that's disappointing. But now we are where we are, and you still have the entitlement problems and the debt problems, and none of that in the foreseeable future might change, but it's got to. Well, it's got to at some point if we're going to be... Uh, Obama's a complicated case. I mean, if, it's interesting if with Obama. If you took a yellow pad and you wrote down all the things he advocated, mm -hmm. with the exception of the ACA, and you could debate the ACA all, you know, that's... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure even what I think about it. I kind of thought it was a pretty good program, but that, let's leave that aside. Most of what he said actually is pretty sensible. But I think you're right tonally. He didn't establish the tone, at least I don't think he established the tone that, that you wanted to have to encourage business and also to encourage consumers. I think now you have, you, have, you have Bernie Sanders and Trump, who you got exactly right, I think, who were appealing to a populism that had the, the ground, the basis that uh, I think we both agree on, but neither one was articulating a policy agenda that was going to be responsive to the problems of the people who were voting for them, mm -hmm. in my opinion. <laughs> and it's there to be done. It, that's the, the thing that frustrates me. You, Marty Feldstein, who was a conservative, a conservative Republican, very conservative Republican, Marty said to me that if he and a similar Democrat were to sit down in the spirit that they, of, of willingness to, 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 reach, to compromise to reach common ground, the way Trent Lott and, and President Clinton, he could re, they could go move forward on almost every issue facing our country, sure. and I believe that. I mean, because I think both sides have the same common goal. Well, which it depends is to which piece of both sides. of the U.S. economy well, and the U.S. Well, yeah, but, uh, but I think the problem is that the extremes... You have, you have people articulating bumper sticker solutions right. when what you need are serious. In 1994, I was in the Oval Office with President Clinton. He was very frustrated because we were doing the right things. The economy had started to take hold, but he wasn't getting credit for it. We got killed politically, as you remember, in the midterms. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, similar to what Fritz Mondale said, he said, you know, these are terribly difficult problems. I'm putting, I, I'm putting in place complex policies to deal with them. And the American people want John Wayne to ride up on a white horse and a silver bullet I mean, he kind of mixed up his cowboy metaphors, but leaving that part, <laughs> no, well, he did, but leaving that part aside, that's the problem, Trish. In, 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 in our democratic society, how can you make sound policy politically resonant? And that's the great challenge. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. And this is the 
the challenge that both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, I think, met head on. Um, I think they didn't either one of them meet it. Well, no, no, they, <laughs> not that they met it, but they understood it, should I say, and they could really um, resonate with certain groups of the population because they understood the frustration yeah, they understood and the, the emotional zeitgeist. Uh, aspect I to agree. all of this. I agree with that. Um, markets, a lot of volatility right now. Why is that, do you think? Is it because of some of these reasons you outlined? I mean, is it geopolitical? Is it, is it concern that, you know, this can't go on forever? Trish, in 1993, shortly after we got into office, we were all sitting around the Roosevelt Room of the White House, and Rahm Emanuel looked at me and he said, what are the markets going to do, and why are they doing what they're doing? And I said, Rahm, markets go up and markets go down. <laughs> and I don't know the foggiest notion why. <laughs> and I guess I'd answer you now. I think the markets, as I said before, I, I, I do think, I hope I'm wrong, but I think they're under discounting the risk that we face. And, and so you have growth, you have good earnings. The earnings certainly are increased by the tax cut. Sure. Yeah. So you have good earnings, you have good growth around the world, and so that's positive. And then you have all of these risks. And I think people are just, they don't want to be in and they don't want to be out, and that creates volatility. Um, we do have some audience questions coming in, so I'm going to uh, weave some of these into the discussion, and, and please feel free to send them in. in uh, we can also open it up for some discussion. But one of the questions is, does the current administration have an approach to address the shortage of skilled labor? This is a very good and very important question right now because uh, you know, you, you, college is expensive, um, and it keeps getting more expensive. And we could you know, talk about all the reasons for that, but, but we don't have time. And, the reality is, is that so many of these kids are graduating, they are highly in debt, and they're basically qualified, you know, I don't know, get a waitress job or a barista job, but they, they don't have the skills, say, that, you know, maybe previous generations, as you well know, uh, would have, and that yet they've got all this debt. So are we looking at a shortage of skilled labor, and do you think the administration really has an approach to address this and start to change that? I think it's as much, I think everything you just said about, well, I both agree and disagree with you about college, actually. I don't know if any of you all saw this, but I had an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago in which I said that for me in my career, that the, the, the single most important course I took was not economics, it was not finance, it was philosophy one at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Because that gave me a sense of how to think about decision making and also the, the, the existentialist conversations in the coffee houses of the Cambridge of my day. Mm -hmm. And that sort of gave me a way to try to deal with the vicissitudes of life. So I don't think colleges should be providing trade training, I think they should be, but the problem of, of debt is an enormous problem. Mm -hmm. But I think our human skills problem is, is yet another problem, Trish. And by the way, there's two sides to that, because it's not just the, the, you know, the laborer, it's also, as we increasingly make this shift into a, a technological society, you need more engineers, you need more highly, highly educated workers, um, which we don't have either. We don't have that, but the other thing we're not doing, Trish, is we're not taking the kids who graduate from high school and don't go to college and giving them the tools they need to succeed in a modern economy. Mm -hmm. And I spent some time recently with 80 kids from the inner cities, and I, and who, I think they were terrific. But if you grew up in, I don't know how many of you had this experience, but if you grew up in, in probably none of you actually, but if, or, or virtually none, if you grew up in inner city in, in the United States, there's a fair chance you have neither the soft skills nor the hard skills. And we need, we need to get the, almost 20% of Americans' kids live in poverty. That cannot be a good portent for the future. Mm -hmm. So we need to do what you said at the college level. We need to make that work better, at least on the, on the, on the debt side and, and how it gets financed. But we also need to deal with a very large number of American kids who will never go to college, and, and yet they should, and they need to be equipped to, to be successful in a modern economy. I so wholeheartedly agree with you. I really do. I mean, I, I, my, I was talking uh, to your colleague earlier who's from Buffalo, and uh, my husband is, grew up just outside Buffalo in a little town there called Lockport, New York. And you go back there now, and this was a bustling town back in the 1970s, early 80s. They had Harrison Radiator. They made the radiators for all the GM cars. Um, you know, the, those jobs have gone elsewhere, and the community um, really, I mean, they have some fast food restaurants, maybe one sort of, you know, okay restaurant, but the whole community has been decimated, and everybody's moved away, and it, it's sad because he, he said to me, look, you know, you used to be able to um, graduate high school, maybe not even graduate high school, get a great job at Harrison Radiator, you know, is a, 
a man, maybe your wife was stay at home, took care of the kids, you had a couple kids, you took a couple vacations a year, you had the house and the picket fence, and you had a nice life. And that just does not exist, which maybe gets us back to what you were talking about with labor not having the power it used to. I don't know. But I think that you know, not everybody is going to be a brain surgeon, and not everybody, and, and not everybody is going to love that philosophy class like you did, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and there's got to be a place for people in society that have different abilities and different skills. Trish, I, I, this is a subject I actually have had some exposure to, and I don't profess expertise in it. I believe if we had adequate human capital programs in this country, that that itself would be job creating. There's a very large company that was, I guess I'm not sure what it is exactly, it was in one of our northeastern states. And they were going to move a bunch, a whole bunch of stuff out of the country because they couldn't get enough laborers. So the governor of the state made a deal with them and said, if I'll train your workers for you if you'll help pay for it, because the question is, we'll, we'll get people right out of high school and also in, 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 uh, in community colleges, and we'll train them for what you need to do. And by virtue of providing the labor, they save the jobs. So I think if we had adequate human capital programs that deal with people who don't graduate from high school, yeah. and right on up the line, I think that itself would be job creating. It's but we don't have, we, it, we, it, it's we, a we good don't, idea. We, we haven't um, dealt with that for, I mean, we, we have not, our administration didn't deal with it either. It, 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 it's, 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 it's a subject that has not been adequately dealt with for a long, long time. Uh, let me get to the next one here. You talk a lot about short-term risks, headwinds, but you mentioned you were investing for the long term. What makes you so bullish for the long term? I'm, I'm not so bullish, but I, uh, well, it's my choice. I mean, I can invest or I can <laughs> open a, a savings account someplace. But no, I, I, I believe, here's my view of whatever it's worth. Mm -hmm. I would rather invest here than any other country. Mm -hmm. I actually said this before, so I'm repeating myself. And I think on am I think the odds are we'll make it because of the strengths that I, I mentioned before. But the big caveat is, will our political system work again? And it certainly is not now. And I, if we had a, enough time and enough and we really engage discussion, I think I could make a fairly persuasive case that there's a, 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 like, a, a more than 50-50 chance the political system get back to the point where it's working, but sure as hell not a guarantee. But it's broken right now. You know, it's, it's I, badly I agree broken. With you. I would so agree that's, that's with you what that I it's am. broken, and, and you, know, you may blame Trump. I, no, no, I, I don't. Oh, no, this goes back way before Trump. Yeah, well, I, I'd agree with that. Oh, and no, I, this goes I think way that it's, it's been um, increasingly uh, getting to this point, and, and I don't I, I don't blame him. I think that the country um, was so receptive to him because of all these problems that had been accumulating. And, and their hope is, is that he will be enough of a change agent to really stir things up and perhaps take us in that direction. I mean, there are people that feel our government is indeed very broken, like you said, and he was the only chance at fixing it. Is it your and view so that he, he doesn't fix it. And is it your view that he is promoting this effort to work across policy and political lines? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And the reason I say in some ways, yes, is you know you, you see him sitting down with Richard Trumka, and you know they they seem to be able to have a conversation where they're relating to each other on a level that typically um, a, a, a traditional conservative wouldn't wouldn't be able to do. So in many ways, um, certainly on some of the economic issues, he strikes me as having a lot that he could get along with Democrats on. That he, I mean, when you talk about, for example, spending for infrastructure, that's something that he should be able to meet uh, Chuck Schumer on, for example, uh, and they should be able to meet in the middle. Well, there are two problems with that. One is his program wasn't basically a government program. It was prominent predominantly dependent on the private sector. And mm -hmm. secondly, because of our fiscal situation, exacerbated by the tax cut, we don't have the non-defense, we don't have the non-defense currency fiscal funds to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I love this next question. Let this next it question is, I'll tell you is I that, like it. can you compare your relationship with President Clinton to Steven Mnuchin's relationship with Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try to do that with, it. I, yeah, I, well, ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what, what one, I, I haven't spoken to Stephen since he became secretary. Mm -hmm. oh, that's not true, I spoke to him once. I, but basically I've not spoken. But let me tell you what my relationship was with President Clinton, and you can just make your own decision, okay? When I was a Treasury Secretary and Larry was, Summers was the deputy, our view of our job was to represent seriousness of purpose around policy and to tell the President what we thought, whether to agree with him or disagree with him. And we were very often 
in, in the political environment that the White House always is, we were a force for serious of purpose around policy, and it was very often at odds with what the political people wanted to do. We were fortunate because we had a president who was extremely serious about policy, and so he would be kind of, he, he would try to use politics in service of policy. Now, you can decide, you think Stephen is telling truth to power with President Trump, or you can decide that he's being syncophanic, and you can make your own judgment about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not commenting on that. Mm -hmm. um, so for the best kind of leader, um, they need to be able to hear a lot of different opinions. It, during they, the transition, President, the Governor Clinton, President-elect Clinton said that we were all sitting around with him, and he said, look, I'm gonna be President of the United States. That's a pretty big job. But if you people don't tell me what you really think, I'll be dead. And he always, Trisha was very interesting to me. He always wanted to have people tell him what they really thought. And if he said something and nobody disagreed, he'd say, okay, what's the other point of view? As time went on, and more and more of the people were new, they weren't used to that. So, you know, Larry and I would sit there, we would disagree with them, we'd, it was, you know, we were sort of dealing with it as if he were a peer. And other people would be surprised in those meetings who hadn't been around all that time. That's what he wanted. Yeah. You can decide whether you think the current president wants that or not. Um, what are your th thoughts on long-term employment? Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at record unemployment I'm now I see right where you're getting now. these questions from. I, I, I I, I'm that. getting them via text messages <laughs> from the rate. audience. Well, yeah. long -term, the technology revolution is a good idea. Quick, quick. Uh, you all ought to get, if you haven't seen this, you probably have, but if you haven't, the McKinsey Global Institute put something out about six months ago, uh, mm -hmm. less than six months ago, and they said that in their judgment, by 19, oh shoot, I apologize for getting the date, but I think by 2030 it was, by 2030, that 30% of Americans will probably have to have changed jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big deal. Yeah. So that, and that's a function of technology. But then they said that they thought that there were ample opportunities for re-engaging those people in the economy constructively if we had the appropriate policies to manage that transition. And it goes to the stuff you were talking about before, Trish. Yeah, no, I mean, they, that, this is a, you know, I, I, I got three little kids, two eight-year-olds and a five-year-old, and I want to make sure that they're going to be in the most, uh, still the most successful economy in the world. So these are some serious structural issues that we need to be looking at, um, for sure. So let me ask you about, uh, Bond vigilantes, because this is another one of the questions here. You worked with President Clinton, who learned to respect the bond vigilantes. This is sort of what you were saying earlier, right? I mean, the bond market's going to tell you exactly what it's thinking. Are there still bond vigilantes right now? And if so, does anyone in D.C., in your view, respect them? Well, this whole concept of bond vigilantes was sort of a strange idea. You know, remember James Carville said he wanted to come back in his second life as, a, as the bond market? I mean, it was this notion <laughs> that the bond market was controlling what Washington was doing. You, know, you, you all know this. Markets are what they are. You can't control markets. And you shouldn't take credit for them when they go up, because if you take credit for them when they go up, you're going to have to live with what goes, happens when they go down. <laughs> and that's what we told President Clinton. never took credit for them when they went up. Uh, others have had a different view of that, um, I think, unwisely. But markets are going to do what they want to do. I, and the whole idea of bond vigilance is an absurd way of, of, of simply describing the fact that markets are independent of governments and they do what they want to do. Well, you know, everybody's been talking about this great rotation, right, forever. It seems about what? like the great rotation oh. uh, out of equities into fixed income. And, you know, other than maybe seeing a bump on the 10 year recently, we're now <laughs> up above 3%. But as, as you said, that's normal and it should be expected in this environment. Are we ever going to see that great rotation? I mean, is there going to be that kind of you big mean, move? You mean, what you're talking about out of in equity into in fixed income? Yeah into fixed income, if, if the Fed continues its trajectory and, and the bond vigilantes, well, so to speak, It depends what happens. I mean, look, it doesn't have to be a rotation. Uh, if we continue to have growth, if we don't screw it up in the very way, many, many ways that we can, and we continue to have it for a few more years, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine that you're not going to see that reflected in interest rates, but also you could have, see it reflected favorably in the stock market. But who the heck knows? I mean, markets will do what they want to do. You know, Greenspan used to say, and I think he's right, that in the short run, markets are psychological. In the long run, no, actually, I used to say it, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and he used to agree with it. But anyway, in the short run, markets, now that I think about this conversation, but in the short run, markets are psychological. In the long run, uh, they, they sort of, I at least think, reflect the fundamentals. So, you know, who that knows what markets are going to do? Let me ask you about regulation within the financial sector now. Um, I think that a lot of people's portfolios going into the election were positioned for a Hillary Clinton win, and you saw sort of that reversal um, once once it was clear 
Trump had won, uh, other than the futures market that night. And I don't know if you remember Paul remember Krugman's well. uh, comments about how we basically were at the end of the world and we'd never recover. Paul um, Krugman's an extremely bright guy. I'm not sure I would look to Paul Krugman, though, for my guidance. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, obviously the market was on a tear after that, but I think in part because people had to reposition their portfolios and suddenly, you know, they needed to be long financials instead of being short financials because the expectation being you didn't have to now worry about Elizabeth Warren and company uh, working <laughs> with Hillary Clinton to uh, shore up some regulation there. Um, so with that in mind, does that free up the opportunity for more Americans to buy homes, buy cars, take out loans? Well, I think, I think the lesson of the 08 financial crisis, Trish, is that the downside risks in the financial market, remember that was the worst crisis in the 80 years or thereabouts, was far worse than anybody could have produced. Anybody, virtually, any, there were a few people, John Paulson, a few other people made a lot of money. But basically, it, 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 was, it was the worst crisis by far. It, 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 it's when we put the that the downside in our system was far worse than virtually anybody had seen. So I think we needed, I think we needed financial regulation that dealt with what we saw the problems to be. I think you could make an argument that some parts of that regulation went too far, and I think there was all of this should have been done within the context of a cost-benefit analysis. I think some of it was. I at least think the Consumer Protection Bureau, for example, was a very good idea, assuming it was sensibly run. Mm -hmm. I think that. The, I wrote a book and came out in 2003, still available in paperback, by the way, and, uh, and you, there's no limit to the number you could allow to buy. Um, and in there, I said I thought derivatives posed a very serious issue. I don't think derivatives were part of the problem in 08, but I do think there was a need for, for more regulation, and there was some of that, not what I would have done to do it, but some of that. And then there were some things that I think probably made less sense. You know, the thinking that was extremely insightful, by the way, of you to be saying, because I think the thinking pre-08 was that derivatives were good because it would diversify all that risk and you wouldn't have to worry as much um, unless, of course, you got the perfect storm. Yeah, I, think, I think derivatives do serve a diversifying purpose and I think they can be constructive. But we had vastly inadequate capital margin requirements and the problem, I think, Trish, people got vastly overexposed as a result. Mm -hmm. And what I advocated in my little book was that we have greatly increased margin and capital requirements, but the politics of that were impossible when I was writing and it's probably still impossible. Can I ask you a question? Do you think that the government made a mistake by not bailing out Lehman? <laughs> Two of my, uh, I, I think on that one I'm gonna say that it must have been a very complex decision to make. I'm going fishing this weekend with Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson, so if you think I'm gonna, <laughs> so if you think I'm gonna answer that question, Trish, you got All another right, thing you, coming. You, you, you got <laughs> We're going fly fishing in, in the Bahamas, friends. so I, I it, 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 I will tell you, it was, and by the way, I have a personal interest in this too because my husband was a young MD at Lehman Brothers at the time. <laughs> oh. I was an anchor on CNBC and it got to the point where I couldn't even, you know, we had a Chinese wall at home, so I couldn't even, you know, cite Lehman stock on the air as well. Uh, everybody was, was so nervous about everything, but it was, it was a crazy, crazy time uh, for sure. That said, um, as you pointed out, it kind of has, has, I think, affected everyone in that we, uh, we look at what happens in markets now and we have that as a, a historical sort of knowledge. Um, we have that as a warning sign. Yeah, but look at, you know, one of the things that I have thought about markets ever since I first started in this, and that is all many, many decades ago, is how short the memory of markets really is, Trish. 08 should have been, uh, should have caused everybody to be far more focused on risk than they were. And yet, look what happened in the European debt crisis. Oh, I know. Uh, the spreads between, I mean, Sp Spanish, French, and Italian debt, say nothing of Greek versus buns, were de minimis. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the markets realized these were not one country. Uh, I was, I don't know how many of you remember this, but the 1997 98 Asian financial crisis was serious. serious yeah. big. Mm -hmm. By the time you got to the year 2000, people had forgotten that there were risks in markets and they piled into these tech things. So markets have short risk memories about risk. They really do. Um, you're right, you're right. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's part of who we are perhaps because of yeah. the optimistic nature we have. Uh, with all that risk in mind, are you concerned at all about a housing bubble right now? I, don't, I think I'd have to say, Trish, I don't know enough about housing. Mm -hmm. I have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you about tax policy as it pertains to states and local governments. Um, 
it, you can no longer deduct your, your state and local I, income tax. I which, <laughs> we just bought a house in Connecticut. We just, we just signed our contract on New York today, uh, so I'll get out of the 4%. But you used to be able to deduct the 4%. You're not going to be able to deduct that anymore. Okay. Um, what's your view on that, and is it going to hurt real estate in certain areas? You know, um, I've been a little bit surprised. Look, the, the theory of the case, for whatever it's worth, and you can argue both sides of this, mm -hmm. is that New York, California, some of these other high-tax states also were bearing the disproportionate share of a national problem, which is dealing with poverty and things of that sort, or for supporting great universities like the California University mm -hmm. System and, and, and CCNY in, in, in New York. So you can argue that it, that it was appropriate that they be able to deduct the taxes, that, that the higher tax rates, the higher taxes that were being paid to support the institutions. Other people argue the other side and say, why should the federal government subsidize New York, California, et cetera? That's the yeah. debate. Yeah. I, I kind of have a view on that, but that's the debate. What is your view? I think New York, California, et cetera, were doing what, were performing functions that benefit the nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was appropriate that if people were willing to pay higher taxes to do that, that they'd be able to deduct the taxes. Mm -hmm. But you know, people have the other view of that issue. Mm -hmm. I, that was my view. In terms of affecting behavior, I, I, you know, I, happen to, I, I love New York City, and I really care about the city, and so I, and I'm pretty involved in it. And I've asked various people in, in who I think have a sense of this kind of thing. So far, it doesn't seem to be affecting behavior very much, but it, right. it's hard to believe that it's not gonna have some effect over time, because mm -hmm. it really does increase your after-tax sure. uh, tax rates. Sure, sure. But no, so I, far, I, Trish, it, So far, well, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons people wanna live in New York, and mm -hmm. maybe they'll just continue to do that. But it's not just New York, it's also places like New Jersey with high property taxes, oh. um, you know, all around the country, really. Uh, and it, ironically, or perhaps not ironically, it seems to be hitting the blue states well. more so. So, uh, uh, and, and, you know, so politically speaking, I think it, it worked um, from the Republican standpoint in this one. Uh, well, but I just question whether it's going to have an effect on the overall economy. Let me give you a comment. On the It'll be interesting to see what happens, though. The, 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 in California, almost every single one, I think, but one of the Republican House members voted for the non-deductibility. We'll see what effect that has mm -hmm. in the midterms. I'm not saying, I'm not predicting, I'm just saying we'll see. In New York, that isn't the case. There were very few Republican congressmen who voted for the non-deductibility. That's right. Yeah, I remember Peter King. Uh, he didn't like this idea one single bit. Nope. And <laughs> uh, nor did his constituents. Um, so the most important question we have here today, <laughs> the most important of all is that whether or not you're going to catch any fish coming up this week. He's heading to the Bahamas. He's getting out of this rain. I don't know if Lucky any, guy. any of you are fly fishermen, but the Bahamas have wonderful <laughs> saltwater fly fishing. Hank is a very good fly fisherman. He thinks he's as good as I am, but he's not. <laughs> well, he's not. I mean, that's just factual. In my opinion, it's not his opinion. Tim, I would say, is, is a, let us say, more work in process. So, <laughs> well, so we'll Maybe see. you can teach him a few things, right? Maybe. Three days? Three days, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy. And Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. This was fun. Thank this you, This was Trish. great. This was great. And thank you to all of you for thank these you wonderful all. questions, <laughs> too. Thank you.